Well, suddenly there are more dodgy statistics than the side of a Brexit bus. Yep, the Tory manifesto has been launched with lots of claims about what Labour will spend, what they will cut, how they'll afford it, what tax cuts will be for everybody and how s somehow it will all be affordable. We take a look at that. We look also at the uh, stack of developments that have been on the Tory side, the D-Day dodging by Rishi Sunak, the multiple uh, problems facing Douglas Ross, elbowing sick colleagues aside, assuming a third job he promised he wouldn't have, then making it look like Holyrood will just be sloppy seconds if he doesn't win. Um, and of course, now allegations about his expenses. And of course, we talk about the debates. Um, Stephen Flynn was judged by The Guardian to have won last week's debate. Uh, we look at uh, the performance tonight and ask who came out on top. And is there just a chance that the SNP might pull this back or is it just wishful yes thinking? Those are the headlines. Now for the podcast. Hi, chums, and welcome to this week's Leslie Riddick podcast. And you know, we make this promise every time, Riddick. That we are not going to late night podcast because something's happening that's important. And every time they do a late night podcast because they think something's important. Um, well, big question. The the BBC Scottish leaders debate, was it important? Was did it did it did we learn anything from Honestly, it at all? I want to scream at how bad that was. Yeah. That was just bogging. Really bad. And I mean, you know, on a whole lot of counts, but I'm a, I'm afraid to say John Swinney was really, I think, pretty poor. Yeah. Um, And it's just, as I said, I think in, you know, maybe last po podcast or whatever column or something, you cannot just keep repeating the same thing. You know, um, I, I'm sorry to sort of jump immediately to a different debate. I think we haven't talked about the one Stephen Flynn was in, have no, we, we last week? No, right. No. So. Stephen Flynn managed to cover. I'm just looking at the tweets that I put out at the time. You know, um, he had a, a go at Nigel Farage and said that he didn't believe in a public health system, you know, and uh, kind of he got an applause for that. Um, he got the first applause, you know, which everyone noted for pointing out that, you know, you'd, this lassie that had asked a question wouldn't pay a penny of tuition fees for a for medical degree if she lived in Scotland. Fair enough, actually, did uh, John Swinney did mention that. Um he also uh, kind, of, kind of talked about um, what was the big ones he went for. Uh, he, you know, he was talking about uh, Brexit. Um, he had a go at Nigel Farage. He was the only one that had the courage to do it. I mean, he really had, you know, he had b big successful goals and he was on it. He was perky and he was interventionist. Um, not so that you would get annoyed with him, actually, which I thought he was very careful to do. Um, he really... And the Guardian, of all people, said they thought he was the winner, even though a snap poll gave uh, the uh, SNP yeah. 10% and blooming Farage won winning it, which was extraordinary because Farage basically lost the room. But, you know, the contrast then was so great because there was Stephen Flynn talked about tuition fees, the importance of migration, Brexit, called Farage a kind of snake oil salesman had a go at GB Energy, what's it all about actually anyway, and had that memorable quote, it's not GB Energy, it's Scotland's energy, which, you know, I tweeted something, that's the most retweeted thing of the entire night that really worked for people. And all John Swinney was doing was his ABC thing, the austerity, Brexit and cost of living, particularly austerity. Everything he was asked about, the answer was austerity. And I mean, also, I may be just so wrong about this, but I, just even using that word, um, it, it feels like we're harking back to a George Osborne thing. That pulls you back in your mind. Of course, what we're living through is a, a kind of a, a narrow belief in what public service is about. A small state, a curmudgeonly, uh, you know, lowest of all all kind of um, uh, benefits in, in Europe, mostly. That's the kind of thing that we're having to deal with and a constant pairing and pairing and pairing of what the public services can have so that, you know, in the end you go, do you know, they're crap. Why don't we just go private? Ooh, why are we paying taxes for them anyway? Nice one, you know. So somebody needs to out that. And just using that word austerity doesn't conjure up anything of the, the size of what is going on here. 
now uh, there's a whole lot of people won't happily won't even remember blooming George Osborne. They'll think of many of these problems as a cost of living issue or you've got to make the case, John. You've got to talk about the kind of state you envisage and the kind of sharp practice the Tories are at. Just using that word, you could hear the audience getting annoyed with them after about a seventh mention of austerity. It just wasn't good enough. He wasn't, I'm sorry, he wasn't sharp enough, responsive enough. And I mean, he's a, you know, he's a nice guy, he comes over as a nice guy, but you have to be a bit on it. Why did nobody take, he needed to take Douglas Ross on on you know all the stuff that's happened over the last three or four days i know he'll think it's beneath him and all the rest of it so what you need to have a go at him because that's the seats that you're looking to get all those six up in the northeast uh yeah I, <laughs> so, sorry you did ask no 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 well that's that that's what we're here for because well that's the reason why we're, we're recording at nine at nine nine p.m but you know I'm going to say something here. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I didn't think it was great at all. And I thought it was interesting. The first round of applause from the audience was for Lorna Slater, when she talked about taxing the wealthy. You know, bang, there was a, a round of applause. And I actually thought, paradoxically, for someone who was questioned by Stephen Jarden about the commitment of the Greens to an independent Scotland, did manage to put across a clearer perspective on why there ought to be an independent Scotland, how the problems that are being talked about could be tackled within the frame of an independent Scotland. And giving that example of the the wind turbine where the steel was in Scotland, it was assembled in Scotland, it's off the coast of Orkney. And I thought, no, that's it was far more straightforward. But I do feel sorry for John Swinney in a certain to a certain extent to, well, to a great extent, because unlike Stephen Flynn, what actually happened there was, as we knew was going to happen, was the Scottish government was being attacked within the framework of its ability to carry out its duties in things like the health service, yeah. the public sector, etc., within the framework of a UK budget and the Barnett formula. And that's the difficulty he will always face because it's dead easy for Anna Sarwar to critique what's going on because Labour hasn't been a government at Westminster and I can ch chirp from the sidelines. But I do agree with you that the attack on Douglas Ross was the one to make. But the problem is that up here, the key the key constituencies that in, in terms of the, the four point differential between, uh, between Labour and uh, the SNP, are the key constituencies for that majority for either Labour or the SNP up here. Yeah, but what does it matter? I mean, the point is, you know, what what's clear about Douglas Ross now is, you, you know, you, you'd think, how is he the gall to stand there? Oh, like yeah. nothing's happened, I would have said. And, you know, I would have said, what we get from this is you're, you're willing to throw your colleagues under a bus. Uh, you're willing to break promises you've made about not having three jobs. And then when found out, you're willing to say that it's Scotland that becomes the sloppy seconds, because where you really want yeah. to be is where all the action is in London. That's not us. Our, all our top guys are here or coming. You know, we, we believe in a Scottish parliament. It would, how difficult would that have been? That's, got, that's no attack. You know, that's not a problem with vis-a-vis -vis Labour. That's just somebody sticking it to Douglas Ross on behalf of everybody who just wants to, I'm sorry, Slap him, you know. Yes. Um, so yeah. that, why was that not there? When you get, you know, even Douglas Ross droning on about, oh, you know, we want to have more money spent in the Scottish child permit. We want more money on this. I mean, would somebody please just stop this guy in his tracks and say, how do you, you know, you're the guys who A, didn't even want a Scottish parliament. B, didn't want any proportional representation. Now, you know, you 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 basically have have an austerity budget and okay there we are getting yeah, back into that yeah. but whatever you want to frame it you know what can we just have your plans for what you would be doing with scottish government and then this is this dr brings you into i'll quite grant you this ludicrous position that we're in now where that entire debate was based on scottish government policy just as you say and there was a crazy moment where towards the end of it a guy who you know was fed up being ignored just shouted at anna sarwar what about gaza yeah. And actually, that was the only point in the entire proceedings that was a reserved Westminster issue mm -hmm. to which Stephen Jordan said, no, you know, that's enough about Gaza. Let's get back to the issues of the night. Now, I know I'm not digging up Stephen because, you know, the problem for the programme is that it picks up what the audience actually wants to speak about. 
But you get this crazy thing that people will want to speak about the teacher. You know, there's a teacher yeah. strike going to happen now in Glasgow over, you know, cuts. It, that's what people want to speak about. You have to be skillful enough as a politician to try and take that somewhere. But it, you know, there was another point where Alex Cole Hamilton said something about, you know, the Lib Dems wanting to build bridges with Europe. Yeah, yeah. yeah enough to put to even mention Brexit properly in your campaign. And I mean, blinking Ed Cuddly Davy. I mean, I did, you know, it's inc- impressive the caring job that he's done several times yes. during his life and continues to do. That does not get him off the fact that as energy secretary, he vetoed building um, subsea connectors to all our islands, which would have helped to st- stem depopulation, which would have reversed a situation where the most energy rich parts of Europe have got the highest levels of fuel poverty. No, I know this because every year I was wheeled out to cross examine him by Scottish Renewables at their conference. So, you know, and he just hummed and hawed and played the nice guy and whatever. And no, that investment was never made. And of course, when I mentioned that it was half on Twitter, Someone came back and said, yeah, and he was also in charge of the blooming post office during yep. the Horizon scandal. So come on, everybody. You know, I mean, I'm not meaning you have to keep rattling people out of the heat. But for the Lib Dems in particular, who are meant to be the absolute party of Europe, they haven't got the courage to even talk about re-entering uh, the, the, the single market even, you know, which is not the full EU. But you need to be fast. You know, and the second that Alex Cole Hamilton says the words Europe, you have to be on them like a ton of bricks really quickly. Um, and, and energy. I mean, I was speaking to a friend recently who's sceptical, let's say, about independence. And he, he was ready to concede. He said the one issue where there is just no question about the case for independence being strong is energy. And the second, again, that um, Anna Sarwar mentioned the words GB energy, you need to be in there. Yeah. Now, I mean. If it sounds like this is too much on John Swinney, and this could have been the difficulty, you might have wanted to have a wee tag team go in there a wee bit with uh, Lorna Slater. And I did think that Lorna Slater got shut down a lot, actually. She, did. Yeah. You know, she just didn't get to finish a sentence. Sorry, this is happening to you now, Pat. This is what have I, I haven't even had a coffee. It's, <laughs> listen, this is me. I've got... Oh, that's, that's my not, hot water yeah, bottle. Yeah. All, all re- <laughs> revelations, yes. Uh, but, but it's just... It's because sometimes I'm stuck in situations where I have to handle stuff like this. I mean, sitting watching this and just it's it must be like, oh, I don't know. Stop. Yeah. The good thing was that Stephen Jordan actually did raise the Douglas Ross situation. Uh, he chipped in there. But again, there was no follow up on it. I mean, I mean, it was it's incredibly frustrating to actually watch because it all played out exactly the way I felt it would play. And the reality is, and, and you know that I said this in podcasts way, way, way back. So this is not my reaching a decision about who ought to be the leader of the SNP. I genuinely believe that my who ought to be leader of the SNP is Stephen Flynn. Now, he's based at Westminster. I get that. I've got a, a mountain of respect for John Swinney, but he isn't as quick on his feet. And he belongs to that generation that will talk about austerity because that's that's his political generation, if you like. But Stephen Flynn's a generation after that, a, a considerable generation after that. And I think Stephen is just a better public speaker. And Jo was watching with me and she said she she felt no John Swinney was making good points on the defensive constant, constant, constantly, but didn't feel he was as good a public speaker as everybody else on the platform. And that included Douglas Ross. So well, that's that was... crazy because, uh, you know, I wondered as well if, you know, if there was a point where Anna Sarwar said something to him about you're not in First Minister's questions now. And, you know, in that format, he, he has a privileged space where he mm-hmm. gets to answer stuff. And if everybody starts barracking him, you know, the presiding officer comes in and tells uh, yeah. everyone very sternly to shut up. Um, whereas all the gloves are off here. And it felt a bit like he took a long time to sort of get going on stuff, you know, like he was... Anyway, we've been over this before. I just I did find that disappointing. And it, you know, my my feeling about this had been, you know, just put everything in perspective is, uh, you know, the (laughs) the column I wrote last week. um, I have had some pelters for uh, for saying that basically the election Scotland is not a done deal. And I still think that is true. Correct. Um, You know, we're obviously getting 
a different story south of the border. And we'll come on to talk about that. Although I hope anyone listening to this will actually revel in the space uh, that's being created for you right here, which is that what's happening south of the border is second. It's the news where they are. Right. Um, (laughs) You know, actually, it will obviously affect us, but we're just our priorities are somewhat different. And actually, it's quite hard to keep that sense of your own centre being in Scotland whether it's watching the blooming news and having it being told that the entire nation is behind the England football team or having a very well-meaning lassie on this morning talking about uh, trying to eradicate sexism from football and t- saying how the, uh, the, li- the, the, the lionesses had been such a, a kind of inspiration for everybody in Scotland. <laughs> OK, come on. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just so many things that actually don't fit. And now we're sitting with an election where we've got... Scottish leaders, none of whom can be in Westminster, basically rehearsing a Scottish a Scottish election yeah. at a Westminster level. And this is where I think, you know, when we come back to some of the stuff, you know, you were thinking last last week that you didn't like the format of the leaders having a go at one another. No. But actually, what do you think now compared to tonight? Because, you know, that is the difficulty of having a, a crowd if you like, it is a backhanded compliment for Holyrood that the, 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 the issues that Holyrood deals with are absolutely the stuff that the, the, yeah. the public believe, you know, finds important. But we didn't get a smash. I mean, you, you know, did anyone feel there was a Tory manifesto published today? <laughs> no, no, you know, did anybody no. even try to stick it to, you know, to, to yeah. Douglas Ross about any of the contents of that? And the thing is, if you as a broadcaster hand over the structure of a cross-examination of five people to an audience, they will, you know, the, the res- results are fairly predictable. They are yeah. the subjects that keep coming up in debate now all the time and keep coming up in FMQs, First Minister's questions. And I mean, I'm there often enough that, that this again felt like a kind of First Minister's questions and it needed to be steered towards the kind of subjects that this blasted election is about. That's your sort of duty as a broadcaster and I don't actually think it was done. No, I mean because immigration, which is the which is a massive issue yeah. in the election south of the border. I, I wind whistling through the, the tundra there, nothing on immigration. And at the beginning, I thought it was a rather odd one at the beginning where they asked, I think it was four or five people, what their key issues were, and the young man at the end said Gaza. And I thought, well, these are the issues that are going to be tackled. Independence was is it, but Gaza? Nothing on Gaza at all. And well, t- it was, till he, till he was the guy till, that burst in the, the end because he was yeah, so blooming hacked yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just uh, before we let go of the whole thing about the football, I mean, it could be worse. We could be Welsh, where the Prince of Wales is actually giving pep talks to the England football team and uh, <laughs> meeting the England football team. So that's bad. But there was a whole big item on the news tonight. I mean, I just want this to continue, by the way. I think forget the leaders debate. Just have lots and lots of stuff about England winning the Euros, and that will turn more people into voting SNP and believing independence than anything anybody else ever ever says about that, with the whole cultural thing that's going on there. Because the whole, the, the evening broadcast, uh, uh, talking on sport on the BBC, uh, it did eventually get round to the fact that the, the opening game, they, they'd covered the German team and the German issues, England and all these areas, and at the end they said, and uh, the opening match is uh, Germany against Scotland, and that was the one mention. That was it. Right at the end. Coming back to the Stephen Flynn debate, um, this is well, actually, what happened after it. It was there was there was also the Starmer Sunak sort of head to head, and then there was a little interview of all the sort of also rans Mm -hmm. um, by Anushka Astana of ITV. And at the end, you know, she had so she had a bit of a you know go with with uh, with Stephen Flynn, which is pretty good. And then she asked that question: If Scotland isn't playing, will you support England in the Euros? And that, you know, just he just no, you know, there's just no two ways about it. And I mean, actually, I just cheered, you know, not not just because you know, it was because somebody was being honest for once, yeah. and instead of just trying to calculate how it would play and you know think oh god you know i'll be dealing with this forever he just thought he just can't pretend you know he's going out to be in fact he might be out now i don't know if he's got there yet or not but he's football daft you know he's in the tartan army he obviously is a kind of arab you know dundee united supporter but it's kind of like you know just for a minute and the wee smile he had was (laughs) 
yeah. it was just priceless basically and then what you know that story of course because it was quite relatable that ended up being picked up with everybody and the next day i think on was maybe good morning scotland there was a couple of um scottish commentators on and uh, one uh, i think i got my kevin's wrong I think it's kevin schofield was on um who's scottish and he was asked similarly would he be supporting, you know, he lives in, in England, would he be supporting England, you know, and he said actually he admired Flynn's honesty and although he had an English wife and kids, nothing would make him support England. <laughs> and yeah. it's sort of like suddenly you've got somebody who's able to be honest and immediate and funny and that exhibits a really deep-seated confidence, you know, that that I didn't see being exhibited by any other leader actually, you know, in any debate that that, that Flynn's been in. Um, and, you know, that it must be very, very useful to them that, <clears throat> you know, that they are not on with Stephen Flynn, Keir Starmer or Rishi oh, Sunak. Yeah. That's the one you would you would just you would cancel everything to watch that one because, they, you know, they, they are they are managing to just kind of get locked into really sterile sort of debates. Now, I can't remember. Did we did we actually discuss the, the Starmer Sunak oh, yeah. debate. Yeah, we did. We, yeah. we did. Yeah, this, yeah, we did. I, we did. This is because I've done a few things on the radio. I mm-hmm. can never remember which is the, you know, the podcast discussion on the other. <laughs> so that that that's still sitting as kind of like a benchmark of you've got to give it to Rishi Sunak. He's a salesman. The Tories are all salesmen. They may have nothing to sell. They may have an old Cortina with, you know, no offence to Cortinas, by the way, but some old clapped out Cortina, you know, with a sort of you know, rigged my myometer or whatever in a flat tire, but they can sell it like it's a blooming Rolls Royce. They can, you know, they have no shame, and exactly. they 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 sit they they figure out what are the kind of you know weakest points of the opposition. They come out kicking, and uh, you know the like Leeds United, if I can insert a oh yeah football analogy back in the 1970s. You know, they're just a blooming machine wall of, you know testosterone fueled yeah whatever yes. you know? but are they because yeah because we come back to it you say that rich is a salesman i mean and i watched the his presentation and i, I thought i thought it was uh thirsty sunak or or sippy sunak because we kept kept drinking the water but before is that, that today or that was which, today right that this was is today's today, manifesto today's manifesto people, in case but, you're not yeah up. Yeah, but the, 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 the other thing about it is if they're, they're so clever, this is an absolute shambles on an election campaign. And we've got to talk about the Sunak's de- early departure from Normandy, mm-hmm. where he didn't stay for the international leaders element of the, the 80th anniversary DD commemorations. And he nipped back home uh, to do an ITV interview and to have an election campaign meeting with staff. Now, is there a Labour Party mole operating in the Tory election campaign? Because I kind of think to myself, did nobody say, look, you Egypt, what are you thinking about? You cannot possibly leave early. Number one, it's the 80th anniversary and there are going to be veterans there. It's you're going to be standing there with Biden, Macron, uh, Schultz. You're going to have a chance to... Bob no was a landscape. You're going to look an international leader with these people, but no, you're going to let David Cameron do it for some unfathomable reason. And then there's the morality of it all, which actually this was an international effort with Americans, Canadians, people from all around the, what we then became the Commonwealth, landing on the beaches of Normandy and the free, free French forces to liberate Europe. And you're walking away with that, but you've done your bit, you know, because you've actually done the bit with the in Portsmouth and with the British veterans. And so on all sorts of level, it was an, an absolute massive mistake that goes way beyond anything that Neil Kinnock did with his oh yes and Gordon Brown's that bigoted woman. This is yeah. beyond belief in terms of political incompetence. Yes, and, and actually... It's interesting to see what it's triggered, really, because, I mean, even across the, the Tory press, the, the headlines have just been appalling and they continue to be. I mean, I, I get out a bit now and, you know, well, if, if I'm if I'm anywhere, I have a look at the actual headlines, because if you're constantly looking at stuff online, you don't get a feel for what, you know, what especially the, the, the London press is saying. 
And I mean, even the Express today, you know, mm-hmm. had a kind of pelters for for for, Rish, for Sunak. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what what they make of the tax cut welter that you know, doubtless we'll get onto in a second from the Conservative manifesto. But I just don't think he's ever going to get over that, you know that because. It, it's too, I mean, I can imagine he could have looked at that and thought, oh, nobody will notice and I've done my bit and it won't really matter. And, you know, Cameron will hold the fort and everything. And, when, you know, it's one of these things where somebody has to say to you, yeah, but if they say, why did you go? What's your answer? And if you haven't got one, you've got to stay. And I mean, I do wonder if actually, you know, if we come back to the speed of his weird announcement of uh, mm-hmm. this whole election, you know, the pouring doon kind of kind of the podium with the the kind of in the monsoon you get the feeling that i mean there was that suggestion that he he that there was many in the party that were rallying for another challenge to his leadership and he got so completely hacked off he practically just apparently just walked out the door and said right i'm calling an election right now because nobody knew about it and you know if you look at the lineup who is actually in his team anymore really who where is the back room at, at all Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, there's still ministers and people that hold the position they hold, but they're they're briefing so heavily against him. They're leaking, you know, almost everything. And these folk are just sitting there for, you know, they've got to sit there. Is there a, is there a really big team Rishi in there? You know, he wasn't their choice the no. first time round. Unbelievably, it was Liz Crazy Lettuce Truss. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, he's he's sitting there just just him with nobody seeming to kind of reality check anything he's doing. And yeah, it's money, money, money. He's a geek that rates money. He makes billions with his wife. I think that might be even correct. Maybe it's millions. Mm-hmm. I do apologize. Well, I think it might be billions. I think it is creeping into the billions. You know, so, I mean, everything we've seen from him is that he doesn't get, you know, when he was trying to kind of like pay for something using a card upside down and, mm-hmm. you know, tap it on top of a kind of ice cream dispenser. He, I exaggerate for effect. He, he's he's just all the time. It's like he can't empathise with what with where people are at. Now, I mean, I don't know about anyone else, but anything that comes up with D Day, you know, reminds me of my dad. He's he's dead, and he he was in he was in bomber command. He didn't talk much about the war. Um, you know, I'm sure many people will have the yeah. same memories of, because it was so awful. You learn more later, you know, and pieced it together made sense to me later that my early memories of dad was when we were on our holidays in, in Scotland around Bampshire. You know, we would always spend a day going around graveyards. I mean, Graham and I were bored out of our minds with it, but he he had to go around the graveyards because that was all the, the loons he grew up with mm-hmm. that died. And, you know, he, he on the long trips, he would be singing, you know, the quartermaster store, I can still sing it, you know, all that stuff that he took from his that period of his life got pushed on to the next generation who are you know the 60 somethings who turn out and vote we are the most likely to vote cohort and it's all of that is emotionally bound up with that vision of the vulnerability and horror of what unfolded on those beaches so that you you know you're emotionally bound up and these guys won't be there again you know, this is the last time, you know, the last big anniversary. You can expect people who are 98 and 100, you know, God love them. But we're not going to have this again. It's like it's like seeing off a generation. Yeah. And to walk away early from that, you know, it's just it's just so crap, basically, and crass. But nobody, just as you say, he didn't think through that that would be a moment where, you know, that the spotlight would suddenly turn around and he would be, you know, seen flying out the, the door. And he has, gosh, you know, when I think of that, even using that phrase, the number of cartoons I've seen of, you know, all the, 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 the kind of big landing craft moving towards Normandy. And there's a little helicopter with Rishi going in the opposite direction. You know, people have had a field day because they've been storing up dislike for him on a whole load of fronts. Yeah. And then finally, it took that one event for it all to just, you know, kind of come crashing down in his head. So, yeah, it was totally appalling. And I, I don't think I don't think today's manifesto gets them out of it at all. No. And and I know this, this is going to sound odd, odd coming from somebody like me who's an avowed Republican with a small R. King Charles undergoing treatment for cancer. He was there all day. 
He stood there. He went there. So just leave that 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 one, that one sitting there. And the other thing as well is it allowed that wedge to be opened by the snake oil salesman himself, Nigel Farage, to step in and say that Sunak was unpatriotic, and he and he doesn't understand our culture, our mm-hmm. ways. And that was that dog, that racist dog whistle that Farage has been playing with. And he was questioned about it. He says, oh, no, no, no. He said, because look at all the Commonwealth soldiers who actually took part in it, by which he means people who are part of the empire and who weren't white. That's the reality of what he means by that. But the week before, when he was interviewed by Trevor Phillips, Farage attempted to delineate between the service given by those from an Afro-Caribbean background from those who came from the Indian subcontinent background when he talked about Muslims. He deliberately differentiated and he talked about war service at that point. And given the fact that the number of people from the Indian subcontinent, uh, both Hindu and in particular Muslim, who served in the armed forces during World War II was utterly despicable. And yet, and yet, He has given that wedge by his behaviour to allow Farage to come in and play the patriotic card. And, you know, and and given the fact that I don't know many people are aware of this, but Nigel Farage has withdrawn from the individual leader interview because Sunak was interviewed, uh, was it last night, I think it was, and Farage was next up. And Farage has had to withdraw because lo and behold, it's been outed that one of his candidates has turned around and said that what Britain should have done in the 1930s and 1940s was declared neutrality and accepted the offer from the Nazis and not fought against Hitler. And then went on to make all sorts of deranged comments about women, etc. and everything like that. But Farage just had to withdraw from that because he's only going to have to go back and regroup, given what's now coming out about coming out under the stone of what the Reform Party candidates and what the Reform Party actually stands for once you dig beneath but again, Sunak gave him that. And I noticed in the latest opinion polls, uh, the Tories are, uh, by YouGov, Tories 18%, reform 17%. It's, it's extraordinary. I mean, that thing of, <clears throat> of Farage bottling it, I mean, everybody thinks, and they build this guy up, you know, like he's some indestructible, tremendous orator and everything. You know, in that debate that Stephen Flynn was in, he wasn't that good. He just wasn't. Um, he didn't read the room. It was a London audience. London is a cosmopolitan, mixed, fairly, you know, fairly left kind of city, actually, uh, in its politics. And it just wasn't, you know, the, the minute that uh, Stephen Flynn had attacked him for his kind of, you know, and just said, can I just say something? We need migration. Immediate applause, you yeah. know. I mean, you've got to be bold about this and take the guy on. But the other thing is that, uh, I mean, I'm sure that that's part of it. He's uh, trying to avoid what looks like a a big, you know, a big problem that he's going to get faced with by Nick Robinson, for sure. But then that didn't stop Douglas Ross being on every blinking outlet there has been since he did, you know, triple whammy of rubbishnessness. And the thing for for Douglas Ross seems to be, I'm beginning to think, that he's operating on a sort of, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Um, I, I did remark that actually on uh, uh, in his interview with Good Morning Scotland this morning, he managed to name check his constituency, oh, yeah. Aberdeen, North and Murray East, I think. I think I've even got it in my head now, five times in one minute. So he's, you know, his attitude is just put me on telly. I don't care. You know, give me, I mean, Colin Mackay came on, uh, in his usual <laughs> <laughs> You've got to say he's just admirably blunt, Colin Mackay for STV, but he was on Scotland Tonight and interviewed Douglas Ross. It must have been one of the first interviews. And Colin Mackay said to him, <clears throat> basically, yeah, you, you kind of elbowed a sick colleague out of the road and you fiddled your expenses. What kind of leader are you? Oh, jeez. Yes. Opening question. <laughs> and actually, Douglas Ross <clears throat> just, you know, holds his head back and laughs, you know, like it's all a game. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he, so Ross's approach is absolutely um, I'm not apologetic about anything. He can talk the hind legs off a donkey. I, I mean, this might be impugning salespeople, but he is basically a salesman. And so it's just a question of he is the product. He's not, you know, he, he can go out and sell him, sell the Tories. And the more he puts the gate, you know, ha- has has the experience of facing down interviewers who aren't quick enough for the fact that he is brazen enough to, to you know, come back uh, kind of laughing at them even. 
Um, you know, the more confidence he gets until he gets to a thing like tonight where he, he doesn't even really get challenged, you know, on, on, on his behavior at all. So there's one model. This is where I don't know if Farage basically ducked simply over one issue, albeit it would have been a bit of a stoter how that that candidate has managed to stay in position. But I think the clue was actually in that debate with um, with with Stephen Flynn, where he started talking about the, you know, his plans for reforming the NHS. And boy, I mean, I know we were only watching, but it felt like the temperature in the room went down to sub zero kind of temperatures at that point. Because he started talking about wanting to have an insurance system like France. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's given that people supposedly rate the NHS as the number one issue that there is. um, Somebody cross examining the pretty ropey sounding ideas he's got about, you know, an, an, an insurance based system. I would be more worried about that if I was if I was him, because he's getting away with everything. You know, yeah. he can he is the permanent oppositionist. He's still, you know, he, he's you know, he's managed to duck responsibility for the slogan of on the side of a bus, but he's just spouting more and more and more, and nobody's cornering him and saying, let's just hear on the big issues what you would actually do. And somebody read up about the French insurance system if that's what he's really going for, and you know, put him through his paces. He's got none. So I think that's why he's not pitching up. But apparently Keir Starmer hasn't actually agreed to do a a Nick Robinson interview either. And you sort of think, no, come on. I mean, that I know that it's probably a bit niche. You know, people are probably I mean, there was a lot of traction because there was loads of clips put out of that dreadful interview that that Rishi Sunak did with Nick Robinson. And Nick Robinson was on form. The fact that Nick Robinson is a Tory, actually, you Mm -hmm. you know, historically was part of the party. You get this sort of sense of, you know, this is a, you know, this is a guy who knows where the bodies are buried, basically just working through every single piece of, you know, failure that there's been over the last however many years and just sticking it to Sunak over and over and over again. I mean, watching that, would anybody be queuing up to be number two? But but yet, what what happens if you don't? Well, it's the same as Boris Johnson. Remember, I mean, Boris didn't turn up for, who was it yeah. that was doing the big old boy interviews then? I can't even mind. But, you know, he, he managed to avoid those kind of deep probing was interviews. Was Andrew Neil? Yes, that's absolutely it. I think it was Andrew Neil. God, the ironies, isn't it? Yes, um, it is. <laughs> but so, you know, so fine. Pro- probably on balance, Starmer and Labour will think, mm, OK, we'll get pelters if we basically look like we're not doing the debate. But actually, you know, probably hardly mm-hmm. anyone will notice, to be really honest. And and really, that was scary watching, you know, getting your legs pulled off by Nick <laughs> Robertson. Who, and as many people finally you know, pointed out, you know, my God, the BBC's finally woken up and is doing sort of what it's paid its license for, fee mm. for, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Now, it would be yeah. interesting if the SNP were given that. I think they are actually on the schedule to be them I and Plaid so, are yeah. basically on it as well. So that would be kind of useful. Obviously, they'll get knocked around as well. But it depends who they're actually interviewing. <laughs> she said yeah. now a bit tremulously. Yes. Well, uh, well, well, I watched uh, Laura Koonsberg interview uh, Stephen Flynn on Sunday. And what she did, paradoxically, was actually stick to Westminster issues and bang, bang, bang. And asked that, well, you don't seem to be talking about independence very much. To which Stephen Flynn went, well, it's going to be page one, line one of our of our manifesto. So what do you mean we're not talking about independence much? Oh, you're talking about, you know, Brexit, you're talking about cost of living crisis. And he then said, well, of course, that all comes back to the fact they're not an independent, so independent country. So he was absolutely excellent on that. And Farage, uh, he was interviewed and they've had to blur out the background yeah. because there was the Clacton thing came up there, which was, which was, which was rather odd. Um, but again, it's, Somebody, I'm trying to think. There's a bit of a conspiracy theory going around that the the reason why the Tories are getting such a kicking is because the the BBC are reckoning that it's going to be a Labour government next, and they better suck up to them quick because that's going to be deciding their their fate in terms of license fees, etc. And there's that. T- I mean, I I don't I don't know. I mean, you know, I just maybe. Think, I mean, they've got a yeah. lot of Tories basically in there in, in the yeah. woodwork. Oh, yeah. it, it's just, I think it's just it's it's more it's more depressing than that. I mean, a lot of people have looked at 
the comparison between the Michael Matheson case and yeah. uh, the lack of any pickup of the Douglas Ross business. I mean, I'm I'm trying to think uh, when did the Douglas Ross thing happen over the weekend? Oh gosh, uh, I, it, it, I, I guess I guess I get lost with the days now. There's yes, so I much know. going it's on. Blur, isn't it? I, d- I don't think it was yesterday. I think it must have been over the weekend. And again, that was after the. Uh, again, it's, it's been leaked apparently by by his own people. Yes, who were so disgusted absolutely. Yeah. By by it all. Um, yeah. But, but so, yes, they they definitely are sort of hanging back yeah. from you know. And and I mean it was that now to be fair they had the the lass who had who had actually written the piece in I think it was the Sunday Mail that basically you know did the expenses story she was actually on Radio Scotland on Sunday morning talking about her story uh, so you know th- there was some attempt to kind of you know that well, that Radio Scotland at least had a bit of coverage of it. Ditto, ditto this morning, Laura Maxwell. I thought was to be fair to her, she actually proved them on this as well. Not as much probing as Conor Gillis of Sky did. I don't know if you've seen this. Yes, piece. I did see that. Go, oh, yeah. Wow, well, that was. <laughs> but then they're all moving on from one another, and that is the the, the interesting yeah. thing because. Uh, you know, because they're they're listening to the very words that um, Douglas Ross is saying, and then piecing together more things like all it takes is one trip that just doesn't make sense, yeah. you know. And th- this is it that there's all sorts of trips back to where he lives that resulted that that are trips back to Glasgow Edinburgh Airport where he, he lives in Murray, which is you mm. know between Inverness and Aberdeen. So it starts to look fishy. And if anybody can spend the time to, you know, just track down where he was doing his linesman stuff, yeah. uh, you know, there'll be somebody will do it and they'll they'll find one that just it's just impossible to believe that that wasn't basically where he was traveling. Yeah. So and Ips you know, are taking a look at it, aren't they? Uh, no. yeah, that's right. But then that, you know, that'll take ages and it, yeah. it won't. And the, the thing you know, the damage is done now or it's sort of not done. I mean, there'll yeah. be a point where, yeah, somebody at some point will call for him to resign or whatever. Um, I think it was Paul Kavanagh wrote an excellent piece pointing out that, in fact, all of the stuff that had come out, particularly the, the business about the expenses stuff, was stuff that the Tories knew. And, you know, if, if there is jiggery pokery going, going on, that is fraud, my dears. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which is, again, that's an, c- criminal to some or at least a, a kind of offence within the way that the parliaments operate and so on. So, you know, they've sat on that for however long and known it, you know, um, and then somebody has decided that it's time to bring him down and that's it. But I think some of that is, I mean, I when I was up doing the Denmark film in the Aberdeen area, I was staying with folk and uh we had, you know, some conversations about the hopes for that area, which then were, were you know, were, were actually pretty high. Uh, the one seat that people were, un, you know, unsure about was David Dugard's seat because um, he had been seen as such a good, long-standing mm-hmm. constituency MP. And I think that's probably, you know, played some part in this because... You know, it, that that I, I imagine there's not lots of his political opponents have said it seems to be a reasonably good egg. Yeah. Now, I don't know, you know, a bit, <laughs> bit sort of Tories good eggs. I don't know. Not really. But um, somewhere along the line, that has just been a bridge too far, you know. And, and even at the time, actually, um, I think this has been a fairly long standing condition that he's been dealing with. It's not that mm-hmm. anybody at the time that I was there was going, well, he's on the back foot health wise. This is going to make it easier for us. It, you know, he, he looked like a pretty solid bet. So, you know, it all looks as shambolic as it possibly can. But still, we we repeat ourselves. Mm-hmm. And by repeating ourselves, we go back to the, the launch of the, the Tory party manifesto and no rabbits pulled out of hats there in particular, were there? I mean, it had all been trumpeted in advance, all the, the, the big things that were in there, uh, national service. And but and then it's this whole thing, clear plan. We're talking about security and the, the launching of the attacks on the Labour Party. And I, I don't know if you heard that the, the Ben Houchin, who was introducing Rishi Sunak, said that if the Labour Party win, it will be Armageddon. And I'm thinking to myself, well, 
And again, from what perspective? Because it looks as if the Labour Party, and I am trumpeting the line that has been taken by the SNP and others, uh, the, the Labour Party seems to be adhering to the same fiscal rules and the same spending plans as the Conservatives. So I don't know where the Armageddon's coming from. Um, but there, was, there wasn't there was much in there at all. But uh, it, it, uh, yeah, no, that was my perspective on it. It was a it was a damp squid. We knew it all in advance, and the little tinkerings to do with the national insurance for people who are self-employed. Yeah, but the one big statement they did make was, and their achievements was that uh, they the Tories, one of their achievements said they'd seen off separatism. Yeah, well, that would be right, Paul. Well, yes, I mean, there's a piece here um, I'm seeing in the Herald that's got um, the Conservative manifesto. What does it say about Scotland? Line three, you know, is pretty much um, there was not a great deal of specific policy <laughs> <laughs> about Scotland. And actually, that does remind me of the the point that was, you know, that was so apparent basically in the previous debates that there was not a single mention of Scotland in, in you know, the leaders debates that Stephen Flynn was in or, or indeed Rishi, rather Rishi Sunak, the, 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 you know, the, the head to head Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer did not mention Scotland once. Uh, you, you know, even if it was when there was an, an obvious mention where somebody had dangled in something to do with the world, the, the Euros, and you'd think one of them would have thought, mm-hmm. oh, there's votes there. Just remember, you know, that they're playing as well. It, no, it's extraordinary how out of sight, out of mind we've we've become in all of this. But anyway, so we weren't expecting there would be anything about Scotland in a total ah, manifesto. You know, page 48, page 48. Really? Oh, yes. Carbon capture. Uh, the second second tranche members will go into Aberdeenshire. You then have to fast forward to page 75. Uh, the SNP have been distracted from the GEO job by going on about independence. The 2014 referendum was the size of education standards that have fallen, drug deaths and ferries are late. Yeah, well, you know, I, you I, 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 see, your, I see your page 74 with an unnamed page which talks about uh, pressing for the permanent removal of tariffs and scotch whiskey. With the oh, American yeah. government. Hey, that's just we've all been waiting to hear that one, you know, and also um, talking about continuing to lay the groundwork for nuclear projects in Scotland. Yeah, that's these these sort of mini reactors yeah. that they're talking about, which they're thinking of what one might go near Thurso. Honestly, I mean, the, you know, this listening to this today was I mean, again, Sunak was bouncy. He was, you know, it, there was no kind of. Once he'd done his little kind of mea culpa, his little tiny wee little mea culpa, you know, people might be frustrated with me. Um, he moved on incredibly confidently through the rest of it. But then you've just got to think, these guys now do not give a flying whatever, right? It's it, This is his equivalent of throwing everything over the side, you know, of the balloon now because you're going to crash. And uh, the, the, the sort of stuff, again, forgive me, it's always energy that t- attracts my attention yeah. first. But the idea <clears throat> that we're now not only, you know, sort of Scotland's going to get saddled with them wanting to build nuclear s- stations here, which the Scottish government can resist with planning, but now needs to really come out and explain why. You know, this is it. This has happened across Europe. There's been a pushback against green policies in many countries, not all. Um, because if you're not doing the groundwork to say this is how we, you know, not even in future create more jobs, but you start to do it right right yeah. now, uh, people are just thinking this is the never never, and then they begin to sort of think, well, I don't know, is the climate change, you know, is it really that bad? And maybe we can sort of square it off a bit, and you know, double it, multiply by five, divide by seven. Oh look, actually, we can have more oil and gas. And what they're coming out with is that, you know, that the future of our security and the biggest part of the cost of living crisis was heating. So we're going to have more gas plants. Yes. I mean, let's just give up then. This is absolutely ridiculous. It's ridiculous for the whole of the UK, but it's particularly ridiculous for Scotland because we absolutely do not need to have gas as base load, we're moving on. We've got all sorts of different ways. We've got more hydro that can come on, but we can move into tidal will be the real clincher. And every time tidal takes a bit of a move forward in investment terms, somebody bottles it. It can be the Labour or the Tories. And we come back to it's going to be nuclear. Yeah, give it another 20 years and you can get some other foreign government to fund it because nobody in the city still wants to fund it. You know, knock yourselves out. Or more gas, which is just, 
you know, mm -hmm. it's utterly irresponsible. That's just not on. Um, and at the same time, they're talking about um, uh, wind turbines on the landscape of England, that this will be, you know, they'll make sure that no no uh, planning can be allowed in areas that could be agricultural land. So this hmm. is basically, we're right back to where they've been for the last 10 years, which is no onshore wind in England. That's what this is going to end up being. And that's the reason, you know, that's the big chunk of onshore wind, I think, is still the cheapest. Well, actually, solar is the cheapest form of energy that you could put up. Nobody wants to talk about that. They don't want to talk about that because doubtless that would go on bits that could be arguably bits of agricultural land. But you could have solar, you could have onshore wind. They don't want that because it's the green and pleasant land. It's the, you know, southern Tory vote. So this is what's just got slipped through today is this incredibly regressive stance on on energy and there is an absolute open freaking goal for the SNP because that's what we should be coming in and arguing that we don't need and you can't trust any of them also where is anybody questioning Anna Sarwar on whether GB Energy is an investment yeah. vehicle or a blasted generating company and what it will just spell out what it will actually do, because he gets into his pace. He starts rattling off these statistics. And, it, you know, it, it you actually have to you have to rehearse beforehand to know that you're going to interrupt quickly there and get to the heart of a big discussion about energy, because otherwise it sounds quite impressive, you know. Mm -hmm. But so, so anyway, that was my the horror I felt at that. All the rest of, it, of course, nobody picked that up. Nobody's particularly picking up that, you know, that the money that the Tories are going to find to, you know, finance all their various uh, oh, yeah. tax cuts and everything is basically um, getting rid of the PIP personal independent yeah. pa oh, payment. Yeah. 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 Uh, for disabled people, that looks like that one's going to get much, much tougher. And then you just think... Is is this not played again sometime now? You know, did, uh, did we not come in with this? These fierce cuts against disabled people mm -hmm. right back in the Osborne days and whatever. I mean, wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, because the IFS have been have already uh, kicked lumps out of the the Tory Party manifesto in terms of where they're going to get the money from, they, because they reckon that they're going to have to to make the savings, which is twelve billion. They're going to have to cut the. Uh, disability uh, payments by 40 percent that's yeah. what they're going to have to do to make that 12 billion the other little belter that they got in there was a particularly interesting one i think about education because this is where you have to dig down to what people are actually saying in reality they they said that day-to-day -day spending per pupil was not going to be cut so day-to-day -day spending per pupil school roles are falling ladies and gentlemen uh -huh. so yeah yeah, uh -huh. yeah so that's yeah yeah so and that'll be your day-to-day -day is not your capital spending correct, either. that you got well done that woman yeah. there exactly so that that's your your building that's your uh renovation that's your rebuilds that's your that's your building program so they're mm -hmm. not they're not saying going to be doing that there so they've already said that just if it's day-to-day -day spending they're going to be able to cut education by 3.5 billion but the thing is, why tonight? Again, sorry to go all about this, but I mean, having heard that, I would have been th sitting with just that thing about disability benefits yeah. and would have been absolutely sticking it to Douglas Ross saying, you're going to take, you know, about half the spending on disability benefits away from yeah. disabled people. Yeah. Are you? You know, he's representing a UK party. They've chosen to represent UK parties. You know, I mean, p people are now talking about who might you know, succeed Douglas <laughs> Ross and uh, there was a, a, a cheeky one of Murdo Fraser running around on social media, you know, of sort of cometh the hour, cometh the man again, you know, but Murdo <laughs> was the one who suggested that they set up a separate Scottish Conservative Party yeah. so they weren't constantly let down by their UK leader. You've got to say the SNP are the only party that is not let down by their UK leader. <laughs> But still, that's yeah. it, you know, just by, by the by. By the by, but, you yeah. Know, aye. I mean, and, and it, it strikes me, Leslie, when you say that, was nobody reading through this like you and I did, you know, for tonight's debate? Yeah, well, I mean, they will have pre, it will be pre-recorded, but, but um, only by an hour if it's still got the same sequencing as the usual debate uh -huh. night stuff. So if it was on air at eight, they probably started recording 
you know, at seven or even half six. Of yeah. course it was out. You know, I, it's just this is the thing of, of I think the SNP with John Swinney has got a belief that it's this ABC thing. They're going to yeah. keep repeating yeah. it and that people are a bit, you know, a bit thick, maybe. So you just keep repeating it. Whatever anyone says to you, you keep raising the 18 billion you know, presumably uh, it, it, they think if it works for the Tories, so that to 2000. Now, <laughs> I always remember when I started work, it was this terrible thing to admit in the BBC. Someone said, if you're doing expenses, never make it a round figure. <laughs> you know, yeah. it just lo- yeah. just looks suspicious. Oh, yeah. So that's now similar, now yeah, the yeah. Tories have cottoned on to that. So it's £2,094. See, that mm. sounds like they've actually sat and done the maths now. 2000 was a wee bit too, you know, a wee bit convenient. <laughs> but still, I mean, despite the fact that, you know, everybody and their dog has questioned that figure, it's in the ether, you know, so that people now think it probably is an extra. Because, you know, let's face it, there is going to have to be more spending mm-hmm. money coming from somewhere. And Labour also isn't more efficiencies my backside, you know. I mean, everybody's tried that. So, of course, they're going to fall short. Uh, so 2000, probably, you know, that probably sounds right. Of course, the spectator, interesting what's happening with them as well. Somebody is, apparently there's a view that the spectator were, were believed they had an inside track to Rishi Sunak's thinkings about the mm-hmm. general election and were, like everybody, sorely affronted to discover that they didn't know when he suddenly announced it would be July the 4th and have now kind of taken against him. But Fraser Nelson came out very quickly and said, we've just done the maths on your spending, honey, and it's about 3,000 something. <laughs> and that yeah. was the same night. And the thing yeah. is, why didn't the SNP or La- some- Labour do that? You know, yeah. it's just I mean, a question of just get specific. If they're knocking specific things around, get specific back. Yeah. The difficulty with Labour, of course, is they can't actually knock back on a lot of things because their commit, for example, the uh, the quadruple lock that the, the Tories say they're going to introduce, introduce so that the state pension will not be, uh, will always be, uh, will not be taxed. You know, the income tax thresholds will not going to kick in. So you're going to always earn, get more than your state pension. You won't be taxed on it. The rationale, by, the reason behind that is, is that Labour, both Labour and the Conservatives are committed over the next three years to not raising income tax thresholds at the base rate level in line with inflation. So, of course, that's going to happen. But Labour can't turn around and say, oh, no, no, you're doing it because they're committed to it as well. And Keir Starmer's reaction. And again, this is why, why Starmer, uh, more, oh, God, more faces in the tune whose clock turned around and, and described the the, the 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 manifesto as a Corbyn style manifesto. Yes, I know, God Almighty. Well, and you're thinking to yourself, you stood on a manifesto yeah. in 2017 yeah. and 2019. You stood to become leader of the Labour Party based on the, what was contained in the 2019 manifesto. You were interviewed by Andrew Neil, going back to the, the sainted Mr Neil, where you actually laid out the pledges that you made in your leadership campaign and said what you were going to do. And you're now turning around and using this, the, the smear that was placed upon Jeremy Corbyn, you're using that smear and you're transferring it to the Conservative Party, a charlatan and another snake oil salesman. Yeah, but the, the thing that I thought was really fascinating, though, going so I know that people are going, which blooming debate are you on now? But the the one <laughs> the the soon the two the double header. Yeah. And the the bit that you know basically Sunak came out absolutely fighting and started his you know two thousand pound kind of thing mm-hmm. so that it immediately lodged in everyone's minds and the slowness of Starmer in responding to that was really quite extraordinary. Yeah. I, people have done, you know, was it seven or nine times that actually Sunak, uh, you know, said this before he actually responded. Now, I mean, you know, people were the, the, some I can't remember who it was, you know, part of the shadow cabinet said, well, you know, he's a polite man and he wasn't kind of going to interrupt. He wasn't given a chance to respond. And you think, cool, almighty. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you'd kind of worry a wee bit about somebody that just takes that needs to be given an avenue to to basically reprove someone who you think is telling a complete porky, you know. And yeah. it also, it's just suggested to me that you get the impression, especially if you listen to the kind of points that Keir Starmer was putting, Sunak was just rattling the stuff out. And OK, it was pretty aggressive and, you know, hard mm-hmm. stuff, but some of it stuck. 
Keir, Keir Starmer's stuff, he's got kind of, it's like he's got a predestined game plan and he's got a whole welter of facts and figures and he just can't, he can't keep it simple. Um, and these things are more alive in his mind than the political danger that's staring him in the face. Mm -hmm. So while there's somebody basically with the political equivalent of an AK-47 rocked and loaded and just pointing, you know, both barrels at his nose, he's still trying to think what it was he meant to say about that or, you know, what what kind of select committee report there was that really makes his point or something. And it's a strangely circuitous process he's got for answering questions. I've got to say, there was a wee bit of that with John Swinney. I don't know if just spending yeah. too much time at a dispatch box does that to I you, think, you know. Yeah. Precisely what I was thinking there, Leslie. I mean, it's just that there is that whole thing of the, the far more gentlemanly, and I use that word advisedly, gentlemanly procedures that go on in Westminster and in, in Holyrood where you do have the speaker. And yeah, well, you'll stop that, sit down, be quiet. Whereas that, that was that was going at it. And it wasn't, an, well, I suppose it had like an Oxford Union debate, never having taken part in one. I wouldn't know if it was like that at all. Well, so, never having either, even though I no, was actually at that university yes. and we boycotted it. But yeah, yeah, it's a bit circumlocutory. Yeah. Um, whatever is going on with, with both those guys, um, yeah, the, I think John Swinney needs to, somebody needs to just try and just stop this ABC stuff. Yeah. You've got a whole stack of issues there. And every time one of them, it's like bullshit bingo, it's not that hard. You get a list. You could get a list of 10 things. John Flynn's uh, John Flynn. Jesus. Stephen Flynn's obviously done it right. Just get a list of them. Anytime someone says GB energy in there, what is it? That line of it's not GB energy. It's Scotland's energy. Brilliant. Right. Brilliant. But there's a whole stack of things like this. The Lib Dems make even sniff a word like Europe. You're on them. You know, yeah, come yeah. on. It's not well, difficult. Yeah, well, I, I, just to say, in addition to Stephen Flynn, I'm going, I, give, I hate to use this phrase, I'm going, I'm going to use a shout out to John Nicholson, who was on Any Questions, and I'm going to put the link into to Any Questions, and because he was on, and uh, same, same as with Stephen Flynn, rousing rounds of applause in Rutland, of all places, yeah. for multitude of things that John Nicholson said. And he was absolutely excellent and wasn't afraid to come in and be witty and be clever and just use the right tone and get the get the, the soundbite in quickly and got rounds of applause from an English audience. And it was, but again, it was, uh, but yeah, again, yeah. hats off it, to John It, it is easier, but then it it's easier, easier yeah. for people who are fighting the bloody election. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's a crazy situation that could be pointed out a little bit. But I mean, the other thing I thought that, that, that Swinney could have done is, you know, when when there was the fourth or fifth time where there was, you know, something cast his way, um, you, you know, you could have you could have chosen instead of kind of battering on again about the IFS saying 18 billion mm -hmm. of cuts, whoever gets in. OK, we've got that. Um, you know, the last I think it was the penultimate question. He could have just sort of said the point is that that, that the Scots votes don't matter in this. Yeah, they won't matter. Exactly. And, you know, you know, when when Anasar was doing his long thing of, look, we can all agree that, you know, in three weeks time we can wake up. And if you vote Labour, you can have got rid of this rotten Tory government. And I just suggest to Anna, she want to get another adjective than rotten because kind of, you know, I've heard that one a few times as well. Mm. But still, um, well, you know, you've got to come in flash quick as a flash with a different narrative on that one, which is. Yeah, the thing is, you know, unless there's a complete collapse in your campaign, there is no need for a Scot to vote yeah. Labour. There and is a huge need for the, to be a proper opposition. And it isn't going to be the Tories because they're going to blow up. Yeah. You know, they will implode the second they lose. And it'll be, you know, all over the place. For, for the politics that we represent here in Scotland, the spectrum that we represent then you have to have SNP, uh, you know, in the mix there. And actually, to your point about John Nicholson and Stephen Flynn with English audiences, you know, the, the, the SNP are the only ones o opening up the issues that English blinking yes. voters want to hear discussed. Now, I know a lot of people will go, geez, I don't think we care about that much. You know, this is like back with the whole debate about wh whether we put too much effort into trying to fix mm -hmm. Brexit for the whole of the UK instead of making political capital out of it for us. But the point still remains that that's a, that's a pretty, you needed to come straight in with that with a different perspective instead of limping back through that argument about the 18 billion. You know, think about what people 
are likely to come come out with. And obviously now, you know, Anna Sauer is like a broken record. Anybody that has to deal with him again knows he's going to come out with that. You've got to rush straight back in. And somebody's got to make the point that Labour does not need Scottish seats yep. and Labour is not progressive and Scottish oriented enough. The yeah. end. Yeah. What did you think about the um, the reaction to uh, from John Swinney and Lona Slater when Anna Sarwar said uh, when he was asked the independence question, which came up last, that uh, it was oh, yeah. uh, it was up to the up, up to the people of Scotland? Well, uh, uh, yeah. I think that, well, they did both pick it up um, yeah. and said, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, John Swinney said, well, actually, I'm going to shock you all. I actually agree with mm-hmm. with Annis. It is up to the people of Scotland. But I think in the way you speak, you need to have more welly because I've got to be really honest. I actually fell asleep. Oh, dear. But, you know, OK, it's been a pretty active day and maybe I was out in the, you know, I don't know, whatever. I did actually drift off. It needs a bit of you know, modulation a little bit there, you know, just 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 somebody jumping straight in or else having a bit of a laugh with it, mm-hmm. you know, because that's what was that's what really captured the attention of people again with that question about the football. It was one word. No, that one yeah. word. No, was the funniest thing that's happened so far in this entire election campaign. Yeah. Yeah, so, despite what Alex Cole Hams is about, why he's constantly smiling, and I thought that was a bit of anyway. Yeah, and I thought no, that's that's because you're weird, Alex. Yes, and, yes. That's, that's it. That's that's all that is. And I'm going to move off uh, <laughs> football for a moment and go on to. You weren't on football. Ah, well, well. Oh, you were sorted. in your head well, and you just head, deleted yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> cricket, cricket. Oh, okay, yeah. Here we Unbelievable. Go. I mean, mm-hmm. and England were jamming to get away with it because the Scotland opening um, batting pair put on a magnificent stand. I think it was on 97. England had to make 109 in their 10 overs, but it was called off because of rain. Scotland then go on to beat Namibia for the first time ever in limited overs cricket, go on to beat Slaughter Oman, and uh, our top of their group, have, albeit having played three matches as opposed to Australia's two, and have got a really good net run rate. I won't go into the nitty gritty of a net run rate. So fundamentally, if England have to win their next two matches <laughs> and Scotland don't have to get humped by Australia, do we go into the Super 8 of the T20 World Championships with Australia and England don't. So there you go. Well done, the, the, the Scots boys, <laughs> for that. And uh, I'm, that's... I'm sorry for that inappropriate snore. No, it's all right. Because when you finally got there, I thought, yeah, actually, that is pretty impressive. It's sorry. pretty it's pretty dashed impressive stuff. So I mean, it cheered me up and fingers crossed the, the football on Friday. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> That little, oh my God! Oh right? God, yes. Yeah. Oh no, I don't. I mean, I, it's one of these ones. I mean, it's uh, people that know me. I don't watch football on television because I don't feel I can play any part in influencing what's going on, you know. And whereas I'm at a game, I can turn my scarf around, I can shout, I can ball, I can point vigorously at Douglas Ross, who's in the opposite side to the to to the main support at, at Tanadice anytime he's run the line with us. You can hurl abuse, but you can't do any of that when you're watching on television. Mm. I feel I feel uh, so weak and non-influential, but I will be watching and good luck uh, good luck to the lads on uh, Friday yes. against Germany. Yes right. indeed. Well, I seem to have managed to have caught, maybe this is, the National is running a sort of sweepstake um, where mm-hmm. everybody, uh, well, quite a number of people have been asked to put forward <clears throat> a charity um, that would receive, you know, a, a win if their team wins. Oh. And I have rather done very well, actually. I say no more than that. Oh. oh God. Except an involvement on Friday in a pleasing way. Oh, God. Yeah, so <laughs> oh, right. anyway, so that anyway. probably makes no sense whatsoever. But anyway, oh, no. you know, yeah. I was expected to get Malta if they've qualified, but I didn't. So you know, anyway. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, no, 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 they didn't. Right. On on that sporting note, um, unless do, anything, do, do, do we think? You see, that this we will never know. Uh, people listening, we we actually think that we basically talk shite after about yes. six o'clock at night, mm-hmm. and. That's quite possibly true, right? The thing is, we will never know ourselves, yeah. if you like. So if you do feel that we should just resume our, our previous wicket yeah. of the six o'clock oh, red line yeah. cut off, do yeah. f- feel that you can, in diplomatic yeah. ways, let us know via email. Yeah. And as the clock strikes uh, 10.18, 
these two elderly souls, me considerably older than and Ms. Riddick, are about to say goodnight. God bless. And we'll see you next week, Jumps. <laughs> <laughs>